The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, so we're going to leave off where we were uh, last time talking about buffers. And uh, I'm a big fan of buffers, actually. Uh, and buffers are extremely useful in my research uh, because they keep the pH of things constant. So if you're going to do any kind of biology research or biochemistry research, you need to know about buffers. And uh, as I'll mention later, also uh, your body needs to be uh, buffered appropriately. You don't want a large concentration changes in uh, changes in pH in your body or things won't function properly. So buffering is very important. So let's go over uh, buffers. So if we talk about an acid buffer, that's something that's buffering on the acidic side of the pH uh, range. And in that, you want to have some, want to have play on both sides. So if you add a strong acid, it can be neutralized, the pH stays the same. If you add a strong base, that'll be neutralized, the pH stays the same. So what happens? You have to have an acid and its conjugate base uh, in the mixture to have a good buffer. So what the weak acid is going to do is it will transfer protons or hydrogen ions to uh, hydroxide ions that are supplied by the strong base to neutralize that strong base that was added. So you need to have an acid in there that's capable of giving up a proton to neutralize the hydroxide ion that was added. You also need to have the conjugate base. Uh, the conjugate base is going to accept protons if an acid is added, thereby uh, neutralizing the effect of that added acid. So again, you need a weak acid and its conjugate base. You need both to have a good buffer. So I've been talking about weak acids and uh, weak conjugate bases. So um, why would a strong acid and uh, the salt of its conjugate base not make a good buffer? What do strong acids do? They dissociate almost completely, and that's not going to do you any good. You want to be able to shift that equation both directions. So a strong acid goes to completion. It's going to drive it to the right. And for a good buffer, you want to be able to switch things around that if you add a strong acid, then you neutralize that. You add a strong base, you neutralize it. So you need the conjugate to be effective as a base. And a strong acid has an ineffective uh, conjugate uh, base. It's not good as a base at all. So that won't work. So buffers are made up of weak acids and their conjugate bases, or weak bases and their conjugate acids. They need to be in the weak range, or there's no buffering capacity. So let's look at a uh, base buffer example. The only difference here is that a basic buffer is going to buffer on the basic end of the pH range. So here's an equ equation. We have a base in water forming a conjugate of that weak base and hydroxide ions. So let's think about what happens if a strong acid is added. Well, if a strong acid is added, then uh, this base, NH3, can accept protons from the incoming acid and make more NH4+, thereby removing uh, the strong acid from the solution and neutralizing the pH. If, on the other hand, a strong base is added, NH4 plus, or ammonium ions, can donate the proton, forming its conjugate base and water. And again, the pH remains about the same. So the, uh, the base and its conjugate acid can both react, neutralizing the pH. So in the base buffer acid, a weak base, B, will accept protons supplied by the strong acid, removing the strong acid from the solution. The conjugate uh, acid of that weak base, which again would be a weak acid, can transfer protons to the hydroxide ions added by the strong base, again neutralizing the effect there. So a buffer is a mixture of a weak acid-base conjugate pair that will stabilize the pH, serving as a source or a sink for the added uh, protons. 
So that's how a buffer works. So I mentioned buffering is very important. It's very important in your blood. Your blood is uh, buffered in the range of pH 7.35 to 7.45, and you have uh, these, you have a, a buffering pair and a conjugate acid-base pair uh, that's in your blood that does the work. So nature has its own buffering system designed to keep the pH of your blood constant. Well, what happens if the pH of your blood uh, changes? So let me just talk, tell you about one uh, disease that is, uh, can change the pH of your blood. This is from a vitamin B12 dependent enzyme called methylmalonic um, CoA mutase. And this enzyme is your friend. I think that most of you are excited about the idea of having all your fat uh, go to energy. So you should be a fan of this enzyme. So it uh, breaks, breaks down from fatty acids. You get methyl malonyl CoA, uh, which is converted to succinyl CoA and goes into the citric acid cycle. But if this step is blocked, if there's some kind of genetic uh, disease associated with that particular enzyme, you get a condition called methylmalonic aciduria. So this is excreted in the body. It can't be converted to the succinyl CoA, so it has to be excreted from the body, and it has an acidic pH. And so when it's uh, excreted, it will actually, there's a large amount of it, and it can change the pH of blood. So even though you have this buffering system, it can overwhelm the buffering system and uh, cause a change in the pH, which can uh, lead to uh, neuro neurological disorders and sometimes death. So they can look for this in uh, newborns. They can do a test. And I, I was, uh, this one of the tests is, is uh, it's not in every state, but it is in Massachusetts. So uh, my daughter, Samantha, had, had, this, had this test. Um, but they can simply look at the urine of a newborn and look uh, at the pH and whether any of this uh, is being excreted. And some infants that have this condition can excrete like a gram of this acid a day. So it's really large quantities of acid that are excreted, and it uh, goes beyond the buffering capacity. So. Um, and I tell you a little story that sort of emphasizes some of the importance of genetic research. So before the Human Genome Project, scientists were trying to find the gene to figure out what was wrong with these patients that had this condition. And here are all the amino acids uh, as translated from the gene. This is not a small protein. That's, that's a lot of amino acids. And uh, they found that the problem was right here, or one of the main problems was right here. There's a glycine residue, which glycine is the smallest amino acid, and that had been changed to something else, and that led to the disease. Now, I want you to imagine uh, if you were parents of a small child and you found out your child had this condition, and, and then you had heard that there were advances. They now know what caused it. And so uh, they went to the doctor, and the doctor said, yes, uh, your child, uh, the DNA is wrong, and so that substitute a different amino acid for glycine here. Okay, uh, what, is, what does that do for you? Like, why is that a problem? Well, they didn't know why it was a problem. They just knew that it had, uh, had the wrong amino acid in there. And so um, the next step was to try to understand what, what was actually going on. So what happened in this case was that uh, the vitamin B12 cofactor had changed its conformation when it bound to the protein. And instead of having this sort of loop uh, structure here, it had more of a tail. So this uh, base here had moved uh, down. And so there, there was a, a different shape to the vitamin than uh, had, had been expected. So when the first structure was solved of one of these enzymes, it found that here's a kind of what the vitamin B12 looked like. It had this extended region, which no one was expecting. And so that had to fit into the protein. So this is the domain of the protein that binds the vitamin, and it had a large hole. And you put these together, and that's great. It fits, and you have happy enzyme. Well, what it ha how do you create a hole? Nature is supposedly a pores a vacuum, so how do you have this hole? Well, what nature did was it put the smallest amino acids there are, glycines, right along here to make room for this uh, to fit together. So what was happening in this genetic case 
is that the switch of a glycine to an arginine did this to the hole. So what people were trying to do is treat these patients with extra B12. You give them injections of it. You have a lot more B12. And you want the B12 to bind and get the activity back going again. But really, no matter how much vitamin B12 you added to it, it wasn't really going to do you much good. It just wasn't going to fit. So instead, uh, there was a suggestion that instead of giving the whole vitamin, perhaps you could just give a truncated version of the vitamin, which was commercially available, and that that might bind and uh, restore activity of the protein. So this is, this is what was suggested once, once you knew what the problem actually was. So this is just an example of a genetic disease. And uh, it's not that common, but as I said, it is tested for here in Massachusetts. And, uh, and how knowing something about what the problem is can lead to a potential solution. But for most of you, your blood is doing just fine. You don't have a, a genetic condition which is pumping too much acid into your bloodstream so that nature's buffering capacity is, is working quite, quite well. So, uh, so buffers are important. It's great to have uh, my, my, my important statements emphasized up there. <laughs> We've been rehearsing at home. OK, so let's do a sample buffer problem. All right, suppose we have an acid, 0.1 moles of an acid, and 0.5 moles of its conjugate base added in the form of a salt. And so they're put into water and diluted to one liter. And you're given information about the Ka of the acid, 1.77 times 10 to the minus 4. And you're asked to calculate the pH. So what do you do? All right, first, it's always good to write the equation that you're talking about. And so you have acid and water forming uh, hydronium ions and the conjugate base. So here. The acid is giving up a proton to the water, forming uh, H3O plus and its conjugate base. Now we want to think about what happens at equilibrium. So we know how many moles we have, and we know what the total volume is. And in this table, we should be using molarity, but the math here is pretty easy, because we have one mole and one liter, or one, uh, and 0.5 moles and one liter, or 0.5 for molarity. And now at equilibrium, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to, when this equilibrates, some of this will go away, and more of these are going to be formed. So we have minus x over here, plus x, and plus x over there. And when we add it all together, we get 1 minus x, plus x, and 0.5 plus x. So the important thing to remember is in buffering problems, you have the acid and the conjugate. So we're used to seeing these tables where we only have something over here, and it's all zero on the other side. But in a buffering problem, you have things on both sides from the very beginning. And that's a really important point. And that alone, if you can remember that, will get you a long way uh, through this unit. So you remember that in a buffer, you've got to have both an acid and its conjugate base, or a base and its conjugate acid. So here we're talking about an acid and water. It's an acidic buffer. And so uh, we can use our Ka value. We want to know what the concentrations are at equilibrium to calculate our pH. So we can use uh, our Ka, and we can set it up. So we have on the top products over reactants. So, and we, we're not including water in this because it's dilute in solution, and so it's not changing very much. And now we can plug in our values. So we have 0.5 plus x, x over 1 minus x. All right, now this is just written again from the last, uh, from the last slide. We can try an approximation, which is that x is small compared to 1 molar or 0.5 molar. And so we can get rid of the plus x and the minus x uh, down here and just have the 1 uh, x term, which makes it similar, simpler to solve, but we'll have to go back and check that approximation in a few minutes. So uh, making that approximation, we can calculate x as 3.54 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. And now we need to uh, check that assumption. Well, you can probably guess it's going to be OK, 
because something times 10 to the minus 4 compared to 0.5 and 1, that's probably going to be OK that it's small. But um, our assumption here is that it needs to be less than 5%. And here it's 0.1%. So you could just take this value of x, divide it by the smaller of the two, 0.5, times 100, and uh, calculate uh, the percent ionization. And if it's less than 5%, you're OK. If it's more, you need to use the quadratic equation to solve the problem. So x here is our concentration of hydronium ion, which is great because then we can easily calculate the pH. So pH, again, is minus log of the hydronium ion concentration. And so uh, the pH here is 3.45. And again, significant figures. We'll be talking about this as we go through. Uh, the volume had two. It was 1.0 liters. And so we're going to have two significant figures after the decimal point, because the volume was limiting in significant figures. All right, now let's consider uh, what happens if we had add, if some strong acid had been added in the solution. So the volume is still going to be one liter, because the acid was added in before uh, we went up to uh, the one, one liter mark. So strong acids, they go to completion. So if we added 0.1 moles of that strong acid, it will react with equal number of moles of the conjugate base to form uh, the conjugate acid. So we can just do subtractions here. We don't have to worry about setting up any kind of equilibrium. We assume it goes, it goes completely. So for the conjugate base, we had 0.5 moles before. Um, and it's going to be reacting then with a strong acid. So 0.1 of those will react, leaving us with 0.4 moles of the conjugate. And that's in one, in one liter. So now we have 0.4 molar. For the acid, we had one mole to begin with, but now we form more as the reaction uh, has, has taken place. And so we have 0.1 more. So now we have 1.1 moles, again, in, uh, in one, one liter. So now we can do the same thing again. So after this has happened, after we have added the strong acid, then a new equilibrium is going to be reached. And so we can uh, plug in this table as well. So we have 1.1 now over here and 0.4 on the other side. As equilibrium is approached, you lose some of the acid uh, as it reacts with, with water and ionizes, and you form more of the H3O plus and more of the conjugate. So we have 1.1 minus x, x, and 0.4 plus x. So again, the, uh, the trick here is just to remember that there's a reaction with a strong acid that has been added, and you need to figure out the new molarities and then go back to uh, your equilibrium table with those new molarities. So here we can set up uh, the Ka again and do the same problem that we did before. And so uh, we can make the assumption again that x is small, try it out and see if it works. x turns out to be 4.8. Um, 8, 7 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. So again, it's a small number. And so it turns out to be one point, uh, less than 1% of 0.4. If it's less than 5% uh, of the smaller number, you don't have to worry about the bigger number. And so your assumption is OK. You don't need to use the quadratic equation. And so then uh, we can calculate at the end that the pH is now 3.31. Again, two significant figures after the decimal place because of the volume. So addition of 0.1 moles of a strong acid changed our pH from 3.45 to 3.31. So it buffered pretty well. There was a, a change in pH. We added acid, and the pH did go down, but not by an enormous amount. And so that's because this was turned out to be a pretty decent buffer here. So we didn't have a really, a really huge effect.
so those, those are, that's an example um, of a buffer, a buffer problem. So let's think for a minute about designing a buffer. Suppose you wanted, uh, you wanted to create a buffer at uh, a particular pH. What do you need to think about? Well, you need to think about the ratio of your acid to the conjugate, and you need to think about the pKa of the acid and the pH that's desired. So here is a generic equation for um, an acid in water. So we have our acid HA in water forming a hydronium ions and our conjugate base. And now we're going to do a little derivation to come up with an equation that will be useful to you in thinking about buffers and designing buffers. So we can write a generic uh, term for Ka. Ka equals products over reactants. And so we have our hydronium ions, our conjugate base over our acid. And now we can take this term and rearrange it. So we can pull a hydronium ion concentration over to one side. And now we're going to take uh, the logs of both sides. So we get the log of uh, hydronium ion concentration, the log of Ka, and the log of HA concentration over A minus concentration. And uh, now we're going to multiply everything by a negative sign. So we have minus logs. Of, of things. And uh, I'm just going to move this now up to the top of the screen. And we have this equation. So what is minus log of hydronium ion concentration? pH. What's minus log of Ka? pKa. So we have pH equals pKa minus the log of the concentration of your acid over the concentration of your conjugate base. And these are equilibrium concentrations for that, because remember, we derived it from our equilibrium expression for Ka. But a lot of times, when you're working buffer problems, you know the concentrations that you added of these things, not necessarily the concentrations of equilibrium. And if we rewrite this expression in terms of the initial concentrations, or original or O concentrations, then we have pH is approximately equal to pKa minus log of the initial concentrations of your acid over your conjugate base. And this is known as the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And people love the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And it can be incredibly useful to you in solving these problems. But I'm going to emphasize when it's OK to use it and when it's not OK to use it, because people try to apply it to everything. And it's for buffer problems. And people apply it to all sorts of things that are not buffer problems. So I want to make sure that it's clear when you can use it and when you can't use it. Um, and it's fine to use it when, when it, when, and you should use it when it's acceptable, uh, but not at other times. It's one of the few equations in acid base, so people get very excited by it. All right, so remember that it's really equal when they're at equilibrium concentrations, and this is just an approximation that we're saying that those are initial concentrations. So when is it OK? to say, well, the equilibrium concentration is more or less the same as the initial concentration. And that's true when x, which is in this particular example your hydronium ion concentration, is small compared to your initial concentration of the acid and the conjugate base that you added to the buffer. So and when x is small, then pretty much the equilibrium concentration equals the initial concentration. So there's not really very much uh, change if x is a really small number. So a lot of the time, this is true. Remember, we're making buffers from weak acids and weak conjugate bases. And the definition of a weak acid is that it only loses a tiny fraction of its protons. It only ionizes slightly uh, in water. And a weak base typically only accepts a fraction of the protons it can accept. It's, it's a weak base. So it's, it's, a, it's not doing a whole lot of chemistry there. So this approximation is good a lot of the time. So just so you know when you can and cannot use it, we're going to give a rule and say it's the same rule as before. When we say when x is small or your um, 
hydronium ion concentration is small compared to the acid or the conjugate base when it's less than 5%. That's what we're going to call small, less than 5%. So the same rule uh, we've been using all along. When x is small, this approximation uh, works pretty well, and you can plug in uh, your concentrations right there, your uh, initial concentrations, not your equilibrium concentrations. All right, so let's use henderson hasselbalch and design a buffer system if we want a pH of 4.6. And a good rule to remember is that um, a buffering solution is most effective when it's plus or minus 1 away from the pKa. So that's a good thing to uh, keep in mind for, for research as well. If you're really far away from the pKa, it's not going to be a good buffering system. And this is a mistake that people make in the lab sometimes. So you may run into that in some of your laboratory courses. So we want a, a buffer about pH 4.6. So we can look at our ionization constants of, of acid. Of course, we're always doing everything at room temperature in this unit. And so we can look at what pKa's are of some uh, weak acids. And uh, acetate, acetate is easy, easy buffer to, uh, to, to get your hands on. Acetate is, is uh, quite available. And it has a good pKa, 4.75. So that's, that's great. That, we can use that in designing our buffer. So acetic acid uh, has the right pKa, and we're all set. We can prepare our buffer. But we'll need to add the acid and the conjugate, and we need to know how much acid and how much of the conjugate to add. So we can use henderson hasselbalch equation for this. Um, it's, it's a, we're creating a buffer, and so this is an equation we can use for buffers. We know what pH we want. We know the pKa of the thing we're going to use. And we want to figure out how much of the acid to use and how much of the conjugate to use. We need to know the ratio uh, of one to the other to set up our buffer uh, ideally. So we can plug our numbers in and calculate that. So we can rearrange this if you want so that the unknown is on one side and we have the pKa and the pH on the other side. And so we have here our pKa minus our pH, and we get 0.15. Now we need to do inverse log and come up with the ratio. And the ratio that we want is 1.4. So we want to have a ratio from our acid to the conjugate of 1.4. Well, how much exactly are we going to add then? We know the ratio now. How much are we going to add? Well, you could use 1.4 molar and 1 molar for example, that would have the correct ratio. But how do you know if that's going to be good? Well, the ratio is more important than the exact amounts. However, the amounts get to this issue of sort of the capacity of the buffer, how resistant it is to changes in the pH. So if you use too low concentrations of both, it won't be all that resistant. So you need to have, if you need to have a better buffering capacity, the higher uh, concentrations that you should use. And you can use henderson hasselbalch then to calculate what sort of the minimum amount you use, uh, the minimum amount to have that 5% rule uh, work. So in the example I told you about this, uh, this condition, your, the buffer in the blood was pretty good, but the acid was so much that it overwhelmed the buffering capacity. So if there had been larger concentrations of the buffer, that would have certainly helped in, in, in that case. So the higher the concentrations you use, the more resistant to change. And that's the idea of buffering capacity. So, and if you use too low concentrations, then your henderson hasselbalch equation won't even be valid. So we can go back and calculate what is sort of the minimum concentrations we need to use for henderson hasselbalch to be valid to meet that 5% rule. So for a pH of 4.6, a hydronium ion concentration has, is a 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5. And so then if we work our... Uh, our equation backwards, we want to be less than 5%. So we have this over the concentration of either one of those times 100% um, gives you 5%. So the concentrations need to be greater than 5 times 10 to the minus 4 moles, or you won't meet this 5% rule. So at least to be greater than that, and they need to be 
in the right ratio. Other than that, you're somewhat free uh, to, to decide what you're going to do with that. And there may be other considerations involved. Um, if, if, uh, if you're working with a certain concentration of protein, you might not want your buffer uh, concentration to be too high. It might start interfering with the enzyme assay, uh, for example. And often buffers are somewhere around 100 millimolar. That's, that's pretty, pretty common concentration for buffers. All right. So um, in this slide, we're, we're doing really well. So we talked about uh, weak acids in water and weak bases in water. And I'm trying to convince you that these are the same as the salt and water problems. So we're going to talk much more about salt and water in a few minutes. And uh, I told you about buffers. So we only have two more things to go. We need to talk about strong acids in waters and strong bases in water. And then you'll have all of the five types of problems uh, to do uh, the problem set. And uh, as I mentioned last time, it's, it looks deceivingly short, the number of questions on them. But the titration problems are long. So don't leave those to the last minute, uh, or there will not be a whole lot of sleep. Uh, involved. So uh, just a word of warning from the past. Everyone looks and goes, oh, this is an easy problem set. There aren't many problems. Yeah. So titration problems do take a lot of time. So let's talk about titration so that as soon as class is over today, you can go work on those questions on the problem set. All right. So acid-based titrations. How many of you in high school titrated an acid with a base? Large fraction of you, OK. Um, so usually what uh, titration problems are meant to do, that you have some kind of a, a no, something known about an acid or a base, a base, say, of known concentration, and, uh, and an acid of unknown concentration or maybe unknown molecular weight, and you're titrating them out, titrating them together to uh, find missing information. So you can determine concentration. Sometimes you can determine a molecular weight. All right, so here's what a, a plot looks like and some of the key, key terms involved in acid-based titrations. So in, you have a pH on one side and then volume of either base or acid added on the other side. So pH versus a volume. And the actual experiment here, you have a base uh, that you're dripping. Uh, one drip at a time, supposedly, into uh, here your strong acid. And uh, then when you reach, then you're looking to figure out when you're going to reach the either equivalence point or the end point. These are basically the same terms. Uh, it's also called the stoichiometric point. And uh, often equivalence point is used as a more theoretical, uh, where the theoretical amount of volume uh, is added, whereas endpoint is the experimentally uh, measured. So we're going to be talking a lot about equivalence points because we have no lab associated with this course. So everything will be theoretical in terms, in terms of these. But they should, they should be the same. So many times you will measure pH with a pH meter. This just shows a pH meter. And for those of you who uh, have done these experiments, this uh, should look familiar. And for those of you who haven't, uh, often what you're doing when you're dripping something in, you're waiting for an indicator dye to change color as an indication that you have reached the end point. And often you're adding, and it's clear, clear, clear for what seems to be forever. And just as you get incredibly impatient, you start adding it faster, and you go all the way to this dark color. And what you want is this very, very, very light uh, changed uh, color that indicates the endpoint. So you usually uh, go, go too slow and then go too fast and then have to do the experiment over again. Those of you who know how to calculate theoretical values could sit down and do a calculation first and then go really fast right until you get to around this point and add it really slowly and be done with lab uh, sooner. So uh, we'll talk about how you do the theoretical value, which uh, could save you a lot of time if you ever run across these uh, labs in, in any future, future class. So uh, here are the two curves that you would see for either a strong acid with a strong base or a strong base with a strong acid. So if you're titrating a strong acid with a strong base, you're going to start down being very acidic, because all you have is your strong acid. 
and then as you add in base, the pH will go up. You'll reach this point, uh, S is for the stoichiometric point. We also call this, again, the equivalence point. And then it'll continue to go up and then start to uh, level off a bit more up here. If you're going the other direction, you're starting with strong base, your pH is going to be high, and the pH will decrease as you add the acid, and uh, then you get to uh, the stoichiometric or equivalence point in the middle of, of, uh, of this curve here, and then as you go down farther, uh, more acidic, it starts to level off. So those are what the titration curves look like. So let's, uh, let's do an example. We're going to have a strong base um, being titrated with a strong acid first. And our strong base is NaOH, and our strong acid is, is HCl. So let's uh, talk, calculate the pH at the equivalence point. Um, added. Well, let's just calculate the pH. Uh, at five, five mils, I don't know whether it's the equivalence point, actually, five mils of this have been added uh, to, to the amount of base. So we have 25 mils of our strong base at 0.15 molar concentration, and we're adding five mils of our 0.34 molar acid. So what we want to do is figure out how many moles of base we had at, to start with, so how many moles of OH minus? Again, NaOH is a strong base, so however much NaOH you add is the amount of OH minus you get. And so we just put in uh, the number of, of liters times the concentration to get moles. We don't need any equilibrium table here. So then we want to figure out the amount of acid added when you are adding uh, 5 mils of it. So again, HCl is a strong acid, so the amount of HCl added equals the amount of uh, H3O plus that's formed, goes to completion. And so we added 5 mils. The concentration was 0.34 uh, molar, so we have 1.7 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, moles. So now the strong acid is going to react with the strong base, and we want to figure out how much of the base is left, how much hydroxide ion is left after it reacts with the hydronium uh, ions. So it'll react one to one. So we had uh, 6 uh, 6.25 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, and uh, we added 1.7 7 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of the acid. So we're going to have 4.55 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, moles left. And uh, now we can calculate uh, the molarity here. So we have uh, the number of moles and the new volume. So we had 25 mils of the base to begin with. We've added 5 mils of the acid. So our new volume is 30. And, uh, and so we have our new, our new concentration. And now we can calculate pH. First, we'll calculate pOH and then use 14 minus to get the, uh, the, new, the new pH. So if you were making your own, little, uh, your own little titration curve, we could have volume of acid on one side and pH on the other side. And you have a point of 13.18. Uh, that's how much, oh, actually, that shouldn't be on 0. That's how much we have, we have after you have 5 mils added. So we didn't, in this curve, we have not measured the 0 point. Uh, but we, we know what one point after uh, five mils of, of, um, of the acid has been added. So now let's go right to the equivalence point. So the way I draw it should indicate that was not an equivalence point. So we want to figure out what, how much we need to add of the acid to reach the equivalence point. So the equivalence point, or the stoichiometric point, means that you add the same amount of moles uh, of your titrant as, as you had. Um, and so we, they're going to be equal to each other. So if, you have, if you're adding acid to a strong base, you've added enough acid that you now have equal number of moles to the number of moles that, of base that you had to begin with. So we know we have 6.25 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, moles of the base were present. So um, 
at the equivalence point, you need to have that exact same number of moles of, of acid. So we know the concentration of the acid we have and uh, the number of moles we need. And so we can calculate the volume, which is 18.4 uh, milliliters or 0 0.0184 liters. So what would the pH then be of the equivalence point? We're titrating a strong acid with a strong base. What should the pH be? The pH should be 7. So somewhere around here, we're going to be at 18. So you can just try to draw a curve. And here we have a pH of 7 when we've gone to about 18.4 milliliters added. So when you titrate a strong acid with a strong base, you form a salt that's neutral. Because the conjugates of a strong acid and a strong base are not basic or acidic. They're ineffective as acids or bases. So you're going to get a neutral salt. So if you're doing a problem with a strong acid and strong base, it's not a lot of calculations that need to be done with this point. You just need to recognize that your salt should be neutral. So now uh, we can talk about what happens if you add an extra milliliter of your acid after you've reached that equivalence point, which is something that people probably have done in doing these titrations, not meaning to, gone well beyond uh, the equivalence point. So first we can find out the number of moles of the strong acid that we've added extra. So we added one mil uh, of the strong acid. And so again, it goes to completion. The concentration of the acid is 0.34 molar uh, times our one mil. So we've added 3.4 times 10 to the minus 4 extra moles um, of uh, our acid. And so let's calculate then what the molarity is that we have added that was extra. And even if you don't have a calculator, we've helped you out. Let's just take 10 more seconds. Well, I think this is a first, isn't it? Did I mention it's a good idea to start the problem set early? Um, yeah. So, so the trick here was, was about the volume. So we had 25 uh, mils to begin with. Then we added 18.4 to get to the equivalence point. And then we're one mil beyond the equivalence point. And the tricks to these parts of the problems are to remember all the things that have been added to get to the volume. So the problem itself is not very tricky of having just an acid in water. But the one trick is in calculating the molarity, remembering all of the things that were added to get to, get to this point. And so uh, by the end of the problem set, this should be uh, pretty familiar to you. But it's also something that you want to make sure that you uh, check on an exam that you're not making any, any volume mistakes. So uh, again, here are the things that you want to remember to add in in calculating this. And then if you calculate the pH of that, you get a pH of 2.116. So that's down somewhere in here. Uh, we've added one more mil. And we're at a pH of 2.1106. And this can be a check as well. If you forgot to add some of your volume, you might get a pH that doesn't make a lot of sense. 
So that can be a double check. Always ask yourself, before, when you have a strong base and you're adding acid, before you've added very much, your pH should be basic. At the equivalence point of a strong acid, strong base titration, it'll be seven. And if you continue to add acid, then you should have a pretty low pH. And notice the curve drops off pretty fast. So it should be a dramatic change in pH by adding extra of your acid. So always check your work. Okay, so let's stop there, and we're going to do weak acid, weak base titrations next time.